Hi, Elon. Hello, Siddha. Hi, Shambhavi. Hi. Hi, Vaishnavi. Hi, Vaishnavi. So, Elon, all three of us are in Delhi, and you are in okay. West Yorkshire. How is everyone? Yeah, good. Yeah. <laughs> A little bit nervous. <laughs> Okay, good. You said it first. <laughs> <laughs> How are things in Delhi? Is it uh, are you still a lockdown there? It's no lockdown. it's not lockdown anymore. Uh, they're kind of they've kind of almost opened everything up, right, Shambhavi? Yeah. Almost almost everything except for except for theaters, except for yeah, performance spaces. Yes, but movie halls yet, but theaters no. Uh, bars and restaurants, yes. Public transport, yes. That's going to be one of the issues that we'll be discussing today about why <laughs> why, why is performance not essential service or why isn't it necessary for our... So I, what I'm going to do is uh, I'll start off with an introduction to each of you. Uh, of course, thankfully, graciously, all of you have shared something of your of your work and that makes it more interesting than me reading something. Yeah. I'll start with Elon. Uh, I'll just show one of your workshop clips, which is from your website. And you could perhaps then add on to that, right? And then we'll uh, go on to Vaishnavi and Shambhavi, right? And then gradually, as and when, I'll kind of keep prodding you guys with my questions. Elon's work focuses on rhythmicity and musicality in performance, something that is incredibly important to the working of ensembles, being able to both feel your internal rhythm as well as the rhythm of the space and the rhythm of your wider ensemble. makes us aware of both a rhythm existing within our bodies, a rhythm existing between individuals, and a rhythm existing within a performance. And once you are made aware of these things, you can employ them as methods for creating texture within performance, creating characters, and creating scenes. It's an incredibly rich and important tool for both performers and directors, and one that I highly recommend. This is beautiful. Would you like to add to that, Elon? Yeah, I, I, well, it's, I guess, speaking to people in India, I, I assume that you already have a deep kind of respect for rhythm, because I think this is one of the things I really admire about the Indian performance traditions is how embedded the principles of rhythm are within so much of the, um, of the music and singing and text. Um, but yeah, this is something that I'm very inspired by this sense of rhythm being in the bodies of the performers and also something that we share. This is the, our, our environment um, is imbued with rhythm. So how do we connect with these rhythms? How do we participate in them? So yeah, a lot of the training I do with performers is really sensitization to the rhythms inside themselves and the rhythms that are coming from other performers and how to play with this. Yeah. So you are an actor, percussionist, uh, composer and educator. So which of these qualifications actually happened first? Of course, probably everything was intrinsic, but which of these happened first and how did you kind of elaborate into the others? Yeah, well, I think you're right. They're sort of all very much um, entangled inside of me. Um, from a very young age, I was making music and uh, performing in theatre um, and a lot of circus uh, performance when I was very young. So, um, yeah, I was very creative, an artistic child. Um, but then I think as I 
grew older, mostly the music and the theatre were the two kind of main areas of passion for me. And I was always sort of performing as an actor or performing as a musician. And then I think as I kind of matured as a performer, I was looking for more opportunities to combine these things. Um, so, you know, quite late, I ended into, entered into sort of academic studies at the age of 27, having been mostly a practitioner for most of my adult life up until then, and then went to do a master's degree. And then that led on to a PhD. Um, and that was really, for me, an opportunity to see how I could bring together the world of music and acting um, and make sense and of this principle of rhythm, which for me was really the, the linking point between the acting and the, and the music. So yeah, that's really been my, my driving sort of journey since then, how to understand these relationships and then to teach other performers um, a deeper understanding of the sort of, of the rhythmic underpinnings and the musicality of theater. A lot of questions actually but i don't want to derail the conversation um let me let me just bring it down to two things um one was this idea of of rhythm and that's one of the things that we picked up based on the 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 work that we just saw uh these are sort of intangible things right so i'm really curious about the process of presenting that to another person, uh, like you said, sensitizing them to something that already exists, which means that it's there, but they are not somehow aware of it. How does that process translate? You know, like what kind of text makes sense or what kind of activity or how is that even explained to someone when it's something that's, it, you can't touch it, you can't, you can just experience it and feel it. So that was one question. And the second was kind of related, which is when you did start offering this, um, what was the response from people who were signing up? Not in terms of what they were taking away, but what were they expecting as they walked in? What did they understand of the offering to begin with? Yes, very good questions. Um, I, yeah, I, I guess to understand how this is done, it's a very long process. So it's difficult to break it down uh, in a short amount of time. But I think for me, the basic principles is to work through the body. So because this is the, a concrete um, medium um, for us to experience rhythm through. So we, we have steps, you know, so when we walk, we are walking with rhythm. Um, when we breathe, we're breathing a rhythm, our heartbeat, our voice, all of these things carry these rhythmic qualities. So the steps for me are really to begin from those elements and start uh, encouraging the performers to notice what is happening in the rhythms of their bodies. Um, and for some people, this can be a little bit strange because as you say, we're not really used to paying attention to some of these things. And so at first you start to notice it, like if you pay attention to your breath, suddenly your breath might become tense, um, but gently and gently and slowly and slowly, the performers are able to, um, observe these things and continue to play and continue to be present in the work. Um, but also I find a lot of the, like the use of, of rhythmic syllables, like in the, the, the tiles from the um, percussion uh, from tabla in India, the use of speaking rhythms is very useful for performers because again, it takes something that can be a little bit um, intangible and makes it concrete. Um, in the voice. Yeah. And then I think once that basic sense of awareness is there and, and it's done in a playful way, I think that's the other important thing for me is if we start becoming too um, technical about these things um, and strict early on, then it actually kills the rhythm um, right. and, or, you know, it strangles it. So encouraging play, because for me, children playing is one of the most rhythmic things there is. Yeah. There's an, a, a natural rhythm to play. So if we can encourage people to play, then the rhythm starts to emerge from this, this process. Yeah. Um, but I think yeah, a lot of it is sort of zooming in and then zooming out. So giving attention to something and then letting go of it. Yeah. It's not so intangible. It's like 
uh, Elon has already mentioned this. There are so many things, uh, the breath, the heartbeat, the way we are walking and uh, your entire city, your house, everything's got rhythm of, of some kind of, because rhythm is part of structure and there's nothing which does not have structure. The second question, Shambhavi had a very, was I think even more difficult. What kind of expectations do participants have? So I'll give a little bit of context. I mean, I just for example, I've, I've been experimenting with meditating techniques for 15, 20 years. And it, I always, you know, I, I kind of understood the principles and then there was a ritual to it that you had to kind of get into. And I feel like last year was the year where I understood what meditating means or what they're trying to explain in books and what they're trying to teach in exercises. Um, just the simple thing of awareness, like if you ask me to draw attention to my breath, I'll start breathing deeply, but at some point it'll become automatic and I, my brain will start thinking about something else. So I was trying to think about how these are things that are actually in us and in, in our surroundings, but we become so used to existing somewhere else, any other plane in fact, except the one that's just here. How, how does one uh, even, I, I feel there's a lot of resistance to that process in the first place, a lot of resistance to even say, what do you mean? Of course I'm breathing, you know, I mean, yeah, I can feel my rhythm as I'm walking. What are you trying to get me to think about? So that's the, that's the question I'm trying, because I think it's such a, it's so fantastic that you're doing this, that you've been able to break down into some kind of a digestible thing. Um, something that all of us experience, but have a hard time accessing so easily. I was coming. Yes. And, and I think this, it's this constant game again of like, of taking hold of and letting go. Yeah. And, but and I think that's zooming in and zooming out that made a lot yeah. of sense. Yeah. Because it's very easy to become obsessive about rhythm and, and to go in and, and then, yeah. And then you sort of, yeah, like I was saying before you, you strangle it, I think of it often like a small animal and if you if you want to connect with the animal or for the animal to to be friends with you you have to um encourage it slowly to come to you but if you try to grab it it will run away um so it's this sort of nurturing process i think but everybody is very different so i think that the second question you have about what people's expectations are is is a very good one because i i think everyone comes with their own personal relationship to rhythm or anxieties or passions or um, ideas of, of what rhythm is to them. Um, and this is one of the complicated things is actually when I started researching what different actors and directors meant by rhythm, I realized that most of them meant something very different from each other. So each of their definitions was very personal and, and no two directors used the same definition of rhythm. Um, and so I think it's such, it's informed very much by people's um, personal experiences in life. So to try and say rhythm is this or rhythm is that is a huge problem um, because actually it's many, many things for many people. Um, but sometimes it can be a bit of a tension when someone comes into the space because they have an expectation that we're going to do something in particular and people are often in a hurry to get to the outcome, to reach some point of mastery. Um, yeah. And for me, the point is that we all have to just take our time and we're all, we find our way there. There isn't somewhere to get to. Like with meditation, we don't have an end point to arrive on. We have a journey. Um, so this requires a bit of um, humility and patience and just curiosity and a willingness to, um, I was going to say to unlearn, but I think it's also a willingness to, to not know. Yeah, we have to sort of suspend a bit of understanding and go back to just experiencing. Yeah. Um, but to give you an example, I had one man came to one of my workshops and he was a, a drum kit player. And so he had already a really detailed understanding of rhythm. Um, but then I started doing the work with him and he was really struggling with the work and, and he wasn't able to get into it. He wasn't able to access it, even though he had this years and years of training um, in what he understood to be rhythm. 
Um, but in the end, it got too frustrating for him and he just left the room. He didn't even say anything. Um, <laughs> and I, I, never, I never got to speak to him again. I don't know what happened, um, but it was interesting to see somebody really coming up against their own um, conceptions. Yeah, so this, he had a particular idea of how to come into the work and it was, I don't know, it felt to me like this became a barrier for him. But I think that taught me also a lot about having to understand that there are so many different ways that people come to this sort of work. Yeah. I think some really, really wonderful things over there. And what it makes me realize is rhythm is something so fundamental and so important, which could actually make us realize how we are connected to the other, mm -hmm. not just other people, but everything around us. You know, that's, that's a way of connecting and that's, I think, even more necessary today where we are, we are forced into lockdowns and we are completely online and there is such a risk of falling into this trap of becoming an isolated entity. Yes. With a whole lot of yes. connections, but not really in touch. So this, this, uh, it's, it's a very, very profound and fundamental thing that you just kind of uh, lost over just now. It was wonderful. So just to pick up on that. Siddharth, I think this was, for me, one of the big challenges as an educator is that a lot of this work, it's very hard to translate it into online uh, teaching because we have, in, in this setting, all of the um, micro uh, rhythms and gestures and breathing that would normally let us yeah. connect with each other is um, being mediated. Uh, and there's always a slight um, delay between what you do and what I see. Um, and I think for me, this is one of the, the hardest elements of sort of this interpersonal relationship online is that we, we don't share a common time and space to be able to pick up all these little rhythms. Um, yeah, so I think this, this sympathy is something uh, I really miss. I mean, although we, we, we can feel good about meeting across over here, across geographies, across times, but we are working at a fraction of our capacities because a lot of our communication otherwise is non-verbal. Uh, bodily gestures, even the sensitivity to another's breath, you know, how are they breathing? And here it's everything is about sight, about not even sound, it's about actual language, spoken language or textual language. So it's uh, we are in a very, very difficult scenario right now. Anyways, we'll, we'll keep coming back to these difficulties that we faced over the past year and of course a lot of discoveries as well. So I'll move on to uh, uh, introducing Vaishnavi. Uh, Vaishnavi is, like I said, she is a contemporary dancer, performer. She's trained in the traditional Bharatnatyam, uh, classical style, style of dance in India. And here's a piece that she kind of uh, created about three years ago.
is created with the help of a lot of people i would say one of them would be the dancer who is working with me uh, in the piece my co performer a uh, very interesting mind to work with i've usually been a solo performer but for the first time i could find another mind uh, that i could resonate with with an abstract idea like this um and she's actually a light designer and a space uh, designer so she understands uh, space and theater and movement very differently and she's not a dancer whereas i am a trained dancer so her name is green francis the idea was to basically open up this game of cat's cradle that i think is common across uh, correct me if i'm wrong but i think it's common across the world i've not come across a country yet that does not know of this game like it's got it's got different names but for some reason it's a very primitive basic game um and it's very easy to understand and at the same time i feel like it's a very beautiful metaphor for existence per se like whether you want to take humans whether you want to take two entities whatever you want to take there's always like two things in polar opposites and then there's this larger whole that is working um in an interesting game um one thing is dependent on the other and then there's this coriolis effect so i wanted to like you know take this complex idea and turn it into a game as a movement artist also because i come from a loaded background of being a bharatnatyam dancer who is used to that rigidity you spoke spoke about you know that, that rhythm and there has to be a certain uh, pace and there has to be a certain form and i wanted to really break out of it and make it a game for me first and then for others so um, that's why it worked well with greeny cuz she also wanted to be like you know forget all the rules let's let's begin with play which was the best part about this piece what's strange is we ended up finding rigor again um uh, in the sense that in the studio it is a lot of play because you would find these permutation combinations together with bodies um uh, you would find how the rope would work in different spaces uh we would try to figure out how we can make it look more like a game of cat's cradle every day and there would be different discoveries at first it started with like a vertical wall then it started from the roof so different kind of games would happen in the studio but to create the performance we actually ended up having to go through a lot of rigor we had to do like core exercises we had to figure out a lot of strengthening um we had to like painfully cut through all the fun parts that we liked so that it could make sense um for an audience uh there were random things we wanted to do with the rope which did not make sense for an audience to perceive right so you had to make those hard decisions so it was a funny like circle when we came back to the rigor um but the fact that there is infinite possibilities at all times like it's gone through i think four iterations by now in fact it's come to a point where we now um work with each other by listening to each other's bodies through the rope with our eyes closed so the whole performance happens with our eyes closed and we move uh in space uh which is a very interesting and slightly dangerous uh but fun place to be in but the fact that there is always n number of possibilities and it's an endless piece and there's no you know perfect that i have to reach that keeps it exciting for me mostly so i can never say it'll ever end but the fact that it's there is is consolation every day sounds like a lot of fun of course Uh, a lot of hard work as well because uh, ropes can be difficult it must be bruising your body so it's uh, yeah, yeah. i mean i also happened to watch you perform just before the pandemic i think so you yeah. are a performance artist and you also perform in odd spaces right and uh, so tell us a little more and of course this has a relationship like you mentioned to breaking out of the very rigorous discipline of bharatnatyam training so so how's that that working out are you have you come full circle again or are you still flying around or i think i've come to realize over the past year that i'll have to come full circle come what may uh but 
the the improv part is a lot more easier i would say now because it took like years of rigorous training in bharatnatyam um for it to become muscle memory almost so there are some rhythms i don't need to think about it i can tune into it whether it's whatever kind of music so i enjoy improvising to that and often it's interesting to see it happen in places where it's unexpected like in electronic music with bharatnatyam at a club it's kind of odd there are people who just go like what is happening and there are people who go like okay this is really interesting so that that weird reaction is fun to engage with um generally i think half the time i'm performing to break out of the monotony of life um and and the training i think has helped uh, facilitate that um so now i use it quite recklessly with all kinds of um, music and art forms and sometimes poetry which which i think comes from within i was just curious to know in the end whether the how much of the piece is now improvised or or fixed um because you were saying you're working with your eyes closed do you do you have particular forms that you're still working through or you're working purely in response to what's happening in the moment it's a, it's a mix of both so it's a conscious decision to choose a rope that is uncomfortable because it kind of brings that element of presence uh, automatically you have no option you can't replicate that piece uh without listening to the other body because it's literally body weight that drives the piece uh but there are points that we need uh to know that we have reached so there are certain um it's almost like you know those dots that you would sort of connect together um on in these children's books so we would have these points literally like that in our head and we would map the space uh physically uh which is where i found your work also very very um, interesting and similar where there's a lot of somatic memory that that gets formed slowly and steadily so the fixed pieces are actually somatic memory points and the rest is improvised so reaching there is an improvisation <laughs> but that point is fixed so we so keep building on that form. so there's a lot of meandering between those points and i i do i did recognize one point where you kind of lie down and that's cue for queenie to move around and then kind of lift you off the floor yeah or cross yeah. and lift you off the floor and the way we know we reach the point is the memory of the weight we know we've carried yeah so once we've closed our eyes I, she knows what my weight feels like when i'm on the floor yeah. versus what my weight feels like when i'm horizontal like vertical versus oblique so and vice versa i'm just curious about the uh, i won't say starting point but the tipping point like where you kind of said this is the idea and this is how i'm going to translate it being uh, weight balance and ropes and another person like what was that kind of process like well it literally started with me doing this and showing it to greeny and i said i want to do this she got it i was like okay then we are doing it together that was starting point <laughs> second point was uh, we literally took a rope uh, we tried actually many different kinds of material we tried uh, elastic we tried silk we tried different things and we created a band like we would if it were a game of uh, cat's cradle in egg with hands so we tried to replicate it there were there were points where we actually made 10 points on the wall and we try to see where the body comes in then we realized if there are points already there then the bodies don't make sense so just the rope so uh, there would be a there would be a pillar in the middle and we'll walk around then we'll realize you know we need something that can create that tension because just the two bodies in the space is not going to create that tension so then came the corner of the wall and then suddenly we realized with the corner we're only getting 180 degrees how do we expand that so we took it to the roof and then we were like were 360 okay great now you play <laughs> okay. so uh, that's kind of literally how it went welcome to hotbird one of the most thriving performance spaces in delhi uh, it's a very dynamic uh, very adaptive space 
Uh, this is the foyer just before a performance. Of course, it's a it's a black box, and there are many configurations that it can be laid out with. So as you can see, it's a it's a very vibrant and diversely inhabited space. This is a reading session which is going on in the foyer, and of course now Shambhu can elaborate a little more on a whole lot of other things that uh, that they do at or bird or did before the pandemic kind of we closed our bird last year and uh, since then the space has been I mean, of course sort of dismantled the theater and it's now a furniture store so uh, at the time though it was the space it was just a, supposed to be a flexible space for groups of people to come and experience something together and we kind of picked on performances as those shared experiences. Um, one is that I've always kind of enjoyed various aspects of performance, music and dance. And I was just sort of getting curious about how people are engaging with performances, especially in our generation and younger, because in Delhi, we have um, really big theaters um and it's uh, i don't know if they if they if many of them follow a curation policy and you know what whether they look into the experience part of it uh and i found that a lot of us were just sort of looking at engaging with the performance as a highbrow activity um and something that you know certain kinds of people did and uh you know like if i went to see a dance performance my friends would say yeah, i'll see you afterwards you know come come hang out at the bar after that so i mean in essence it was just like how do we create a space where people of all ages and interests can come and can see something together and it's informal and there are very few barriers there um even between stage and seating it was a very conscious thing to not have those things be fixed um and i mean one thing led to another we had a concept note then we started thinking about a physical space this was a project i co-founded with my partner akhil uh, who is someone i knew from school and we used to talk about this these two years before oddbird actually opened um and that's pretty much it we we just decided to have a black box theater a small black box theater 100 seater and some kind of a lobby outside where people could mix uh, before the event and after the event and even the performers themselves would not sort of be stuck in a VIP area or a green room area. They would be able to come out and engage with the, the audiences that had come and even those kind of barriers that this is someone else who is doing this and this is, um, it's, it's, inaccessible to me you know be able to break that because the guy is sitting at the table right next to you you know and you can walk across and have a conversation so it was in essence just yeah it was like a envisioned as a space for groups to interact and to engage with performing arts and to demystify a lot of that and um, it was a lot of fun all of it uh, from hunting around for the right space to um, you know all the home experiments we did with what kind of chairs to have and what kind of tables to design and uh, this whole debate over bathrooms you know how many were too many <laughs> how many were just enough we did one lines and essentially yeah you know we were always thinking about things from a audience's perspective to see how we could bridge the gap because there were a lot of um, performers who would come in with uh, a lot of idea and investment in the performance and the aspect of somehow reaching out to the audience uh, was something that either people didn't get time to think about because they were most often rehearsing in different spaces and then just jumping onto the stage um, or it was something that they felt the audience should just get and shouldn't require any kind of explanation. And uh, we kind of came in and said, you know, we get why this is a great performance, but we want the other people who come in here also to feel the same way. So how do we think about every aspect of their engagement with this and facilitate that connection as, as much as possible? 
so from what the tickets were to how the seating policy worked to what the social media post said so in fact just that the the thing that i asked you right like how do you explain this to someone very often we would have activities or workshops or performances in the space that we understood because we had experienced it in some way either at a rehearsal or through a video or something and then there was the question of how to explain this or how to to talk about this to an audience um and not have it be something that would alienate them and now you have to think about all the things that would alienate them if it sounds too artsy it alienates them if it sounds too technical it alienates them if it sounds too esoteric or philosophical it alienates them so how do we kind of talk about these things you know and i've i really wondered for a long time about how to write about performances in general because you're describing art and feelings and and perspectives what words do you put those in so that it's really easily understood by the reader um and then of course you know like eating drinking um what should the space look like uh we were intentional to not hire a designer or a or a um like an interior person because no offense siddharth i didn't know you then <laughs> um but you know they, they there was this fear of a space being sort of looking like it was designed like a like a, a kind of a design stamp that that tends to happen um and so we we kind of engaged with a studio and and we worked out the basics of the structure you know that we needed bathroom where and how does the plumbing work and how does the electricals work and we kind of had a basic structure then that we said okay is this enough to get started with once the acs were functional yes it's enough to get started with and we did and the whole process was just what's the least you need to do to have to just get started take the first step and then iterate and then experiment again and then okay this worked this didn't work experiment again and we were you know it was a great process of always questioning yourself and then looking at feedback that you're getting from outside but also trying to stay true to what you felt was the vision for the space um and those were those were really interesting decisions to navigate and uh, along the way it was it kind of became a space for different reasons you know uh, there was the audience of course but there was the people who worked there there was the people who volunteered there people who rehearsed and performed there and that was the that was the most sort of rewarding fulfilling i mean if there was any purpose i was looking for for the space that was it uh also because we were located at that time in a in a kind of a district where new spaces were coming up new restaurants new studios new design boutiques uh, designer boutiques etc so all the young folks who were working in those places you know they would also co- come on their lunch break and um and so a we got to talk about our experiences about what was happening who who was performing what themes that kind of unearth for us at that time and we were being able to talk about it without purpose but with a larger group of people than we would have to begin with you know when someone from cafe dori walks in cafe dori was the restaurant uh, right across the road from us uh we didn't have an agenda to say you need to come and see the show in the evening we would just start having a conversation and, and it would lead to oh so what's happening today this is happening today this is what we've been thinking about it so i mean on on many levels it was just a lot of experimenting and a lot of um, trying to build relationships in different ways and great learning and a lot of fun yeah indeed a lot of fun indeed in fact the whole fact that it, it has grown over time and you said what is the basic that we need to start with and then over time it really grew so uh, there are a lot of these uh, design principles which i try to kind of uh, get students to pay attention to that don't don't try to put in like in a way what elon talked about you know that don't uh, be too strict about the discipline or try don't try to force something out allow it to come out so that organic quality of growth but what i'm uh, find of real interest over here is you said that uh, all these performance spaces they have they acquired this highbrow kind of a, 
because of quality which you wanted to get out of you wanted it to be much more accessible uh, you're saying that we didn't want to alienate people and how do you write about it how do you not make it move into some kind of a specialization where it will alienate people so at the same time you're not trying to be populist because the kind of work that i have experienced at oddbird is is amazing to say the least really brilliant work which has come out so it's not like this populist work mainstream work which you would just trying to create to uh, you know post to make money or something like that i don't know how you guys pull that the real i think compass was that we were not trying to be curators or art managers it really was like did we find it interesting i mean we came up with the criteria ourselves within the team and it was kind of driven by you know like similar to what vaishnavi said she wanted to find it interesting and then she would figure out a way for somebody else to get involved in it yeah. so in our heads work was not alternate or mainstream in fact like it made me think a lot about it because people would say oddbird is an alternate space mm-hmm. and then i was like what represents an alternate space because we are not trying to find a difference from the mainstream we're just saying this is like this is as good as anything else and it deserves to be experienced and in case you have preconceived notions about it here's what we think yeah so again like we were coming from the perspective of the audience hey we found it interesting maybe you should check it out and the idea was to try and stay true to that as much as possible because uh we can't claim what constitutes great art or not right it in any case it's a very subjective kind of process so it was more about sort of saying there's lots of interesting things happening out there and here are some of those things that caught our fancy and we could sort of bring into the space um and i feel like some of that resonated with people because they kind of came to say okay more or less whatever i see here will be okay i might my might love it i might think it was like what but i'll have a good evening overall um and that was enough because people came for stuff that they wouldn't otherwise have come for and people brought their parents and they brought their grandparents and i mean like seeing 70 year olds being wheeled in to watch a rock concert um i mean it was great i was just like clearly the boundaries are all in in perception and they're flexible and that was the interesting thing to navigate sounds fantastic as as it was what i'm tying uh, through over here is you are talking about shambhi having your skin in the game basically that's that's the bottom line that was your compass you said is it interesting for me right which uh, is in a way what vaishnavi is talking about about being in touch with the others body you know finding what elon talked about finding the play becoming present so this all of these basically essentially are talking about your presence as as the person as the artist or as the facilitator or whatever you may want to call it. so this presence is something again which is perhaps the most fundamental thing for all of us i'm really inspired by what you're saying about the venue it's really amazing to hear these stories um and I, i think just wanted to pick up on the thing you were saying towards the end about um how much the boundary is just in people's perceptions um of the work from the outside or how much how much that actually exists and so a lot of the work it seems you're doing is really about breaking down the perception that there's a boundary between them and coming to engage in the venue and i'm just curious i, I think you already gave some examples of that but i'm wondering um Yeah, I think the 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 thing I was curious about was whether it's just enough to break down that perception and then once people get in to the space and they see the work if the work is good then it will connect with them um or whether you feel like there is was an extra step you needed to take in terms of the curation of the work I think you gave a, few, a little bit of a hint that you tried to encourage the performers to go a little bit further than they might normally do so I wondered if you could talk about that Like how once people are in the door, what is necessary to really keep their trust um, in the work? 
I think it was important for it to feel like a a personal experience rather than a transaction um where in someone comes in with the expectation that I have paid for this ticket and I'm owed something now and this and this is a transaction between me and either the space or me and the artist and it i mean it just started with kind of breaking down some of that because a we were very clear that um artists would always get paid for performances and there would never be a free performance um or free pass kind of system uh and the second was that it was very it was made very clear to the audiences that their what they were putting towards the ticket was enabling that performance or enabling some aspect of that performance for the artist so it was more about supporting um a community or supporting things that were happening or that you wanted to experience being a part of that by making a contribution that was one thing so just just kind of a whole breaking down of barriers at many different points um how are they interacting with the space so even the fact that uh, we had certain points where volunteers would kind of take over those positions whether it was at the cash counter or the ticket counter or we would serve some refreshments over there so when someone's walking in they're not kind of seeing business points everywhere they're seeing people who they can talk to who they can chat with about the performance and at every point it's not like you are afraid of looking foolish or you are you know you have to impress someone it's you know like the volunteers would be like i haven't seen the show but this is what i've heard about it you know because the idea was to just have a conversation it wasn't to convert people it wasn't to open their eyes any more than them just walking in and uh, from the artist perspective it was of course like even when we from the point where we were trying to write about their work in our on our website or in our social media i mean this used to be a point of conversation because they would come in with their kind of synopsis that they had been sending everywhere and then we would rewrite it and say this is how we want to present it to the audiences that we're calling in and they would say no this doesn't work or some people would say it's not a problem at all but even that point where we're having a conversation with the artist to say we love the work you love the work we understand the sentiment but this is how we want to bridge the gap between what you're trying to do and the audience that we believe will love this um so they also kind of start thinking about how they want to be in the space or how they want to engage with the audience before they're even there um and lastly yes encouraging them to be out and about uh, in the same lobby that normal audience members were in um you know they would have a meal there at the end of their show uh people would kind of mill around have a conversation if they loved it lots of people would swarm around them um and sometimes or often enough there would be two or three people left who would then hang out and chat with the artist or the or the group that was left behind and you know got to see two things one is that a this is a person uh and and not some kind of a a, a separate being um but b how also they are channeling passion and creativity and create and putting something out there that this person has bonded so much with just so long ago um and of course getting artists to volunteer as often as we could so when they were the ones who were you know handing out a uh, a coffee at the counter and then they were the ones who were inside on stage uh it kind of already starts to build up this familiarity and community and you know then that guy being able to say okay i don't have a problem having a conversation with this guy uh and if it wasn't about the work directly it was very often about questions that came out of the work or attitudes that the work represented or even like i know that some that, that there have been people who've gone up and said i loved it but i didn't understand anything right and the person actually engaged with that conversation and then you know the the lady who asked the rest of her family also gathered there and you know i think the younger girls were a little bit embarrassed like why is this aunt kind of having this conversation and she's telling me i'm so sorry i'm so sorry but actually the artist enjoyed that interaction and she enjoyed a chance to be able to have a dialogue um and not get offended or not get defensive and just be able to have a conversation 
all of which I think over a set of you know cumulative experiences go help people in general engage differently with some of these things. And uh, I mean, we were just getting started, but um, we had a good run for as long as we did. I think what's interesting to me now is that I'm looking at aspects of how what we were trying to do organically in Oddbird, we can kind of um, almost facilitate through a choreographed methodology. So like you said, like, how are you going to go a step further? Or did you go a step further? That's exactly the question I'm trying to answer right now. I don't know, Elon, if, uh, if you did appreciate the rhythm, which is part of uh, the Indian culture and uh, Indian milieu. But I don't know if you understand how hierarchies are extremely serious in India. Right? World over, there would be uh, social hierarchies, there would be racial uh, segregation here we also have castes and uh, probably in, in the west it's much more easier for artists to kind of mingle with with people you know so that divide is very less but i think what shambhavi is really trying trying to point out over here and also was the starting point for oddbird was to kind of how do you kind of diffuse these boundaries and i think oddbird did that beautifully as she's been uh, elaborating I just had something to add. Uh, I have been a volunteer, an artist, person who's rehearsed there, the furniture, the curtains. <laughs> I've been everything at Oddbird. And it's been a very, very interesting experience because, um, again, classical, this whole hierarchy that uh, Siddharth spoke about actually comes from temple tradition, where there is an elevated platform and then there is an audience that is listening to sort of a communication, not just one place, but one of the places where it comes from. So it was very interesting and refreshing to actually finally see that tradition break because it had created those hierarchies of the performer being a completely different entity. Uh, the fact that I could be a broke performer <laughs> coming to volunteer and watch another performer perform was, was important for me. Like it, it Built, it helped me build my own vocabulary of um, material that I could engage with, which I don't think any other space was doing at that time in Delhi. Overall, That's as someone, I've experienced the whole process as an audience member and all that. It, I, it was, it's really sad that it doesn't exist anymore. I mean, an end is only a beginning to another thing. So uh, before we get to the new beginning, Shambhavi, how have you engaged with uh, performance or art, theater over the past year? Uh, I can give you the, the, what is it, the practical answer and the meta answer. <laughs> so the practical answer is not very much. <clears throat> um, whatever I saw, I saw online. And uh, I think it was just a case of just experiencing the various platforms that were being employed in different ways to showcase performance. So whether it was audio only, and that was through call-in performances or through uh, podcasts, or whether it was Zoom performances, uh, Facebook Lives, um, or even websites that had been constructed specifically for a performance where you go in and you kind of guide it through the website to see it. So. I mean, it was just for me like a great way to see how <clears throat> different people were engaging with the online medium and trying to translate um, performance there. So, and you know, also the idea of it being a period of experimentation. I think a lot of us kind of wrote off the whole uh, online medium to say, it will never replace a real live interaction. And of course it will not. But does that mean that it's completely useless? And I kind of started tuning into some of the aspects that the online thing was uh, maybe being able to do better than, than uh, an offline experience was being able to do. So just kind of noticing some of those things, you know, like what is, if this medium had to be used for something, what, what are the things that it's, it's being able to do well? Um, and I think uh, overall in terms of the idea of theatre itself, just delving more into 
an audience's perspective through the study of one. So, you know, just um, I've spent a lot of time on awareness exercises and I mean, it's all part of a different story of growth, but um, what I'm doing today is pulling out everything that I spent time thinking and reflecting on the last year and trying to connect it now to work. Um, but how do emotions work and how are they experienced and how are they accessed and who finds it easier to talk about these things and who doesn't and what role does um, a performance or a piece of work have in lowering barriers or sort of countering resistances uh, or offering a prompt for a conversation and then if that conversation is going to be difficult how you know where do we kind of how do we pick some of those things there and to take I mean and this has been about like you know all kinds of emotional turmoil that everyone has experienced over the last year for various reasons I'm wondering what I can take from that that I can use to say okay here's this piece of work and um, here's all this new stuff I know about experiencing things and now can we come up with some kind of a format in which this can be experienced where the where some of these aspects get amplified where your ability to talk about the the uh, emotional content or being being able to uh, access your own awareness at that time can happen so it's not just a passive experience of view um, hear and leave but it's I viewed it, what did it do inside, how did I become aware of it, what am I saying back to someone, how am I experiencing the other people who saw it with me, how, how am I discussing it with them and is that helping us as a group of people move our conversation a little bit further on the various fault lines that exist in all societies of course but I am thinking about the ones that we kind of um, deal with a lot. Tough work that you're you're doing right now. It's wonderful. <laughs> wonderful to hear. All that. <laughs>